So welcome and greetings for whatever time of the day it is in your part of the world. I am Gunjan Veda from the Movement for Community-Led Development and uh, great to have you with us in the session on Community-Led Monitoring and Evaluation. We have a 75 minute session with some wonderful panelists and uh, we're going to try a different style of running this meeting, what we call the fishbowl discussion style and we'll explain that when we come to it. But the idea is that our panelists are going to share with us some information around, you know, around community-led mail, and they're going to share with us tools, but then we want this to be, um, to be a peer-to-peer -peer learning session. So that's what's going to happen. If we go to the next slide, please. So the purpose really of today's session is that we know now increasingly there is a realization that you know, communities need to be front and center in development, that the top-down approach to development cannot work. But if communities have to be decision makers, if they have to lead their own development, then like us, they need to also have the information. And what information is needed for them to design programs also needs to be decided by them. So in other words, Monitoring and evaluation for community-led development programs cannot be the usual monitoring and evaluations that we do with our programs. They cannot be extractive uh, and they have to involve the community. So how does, what does that mean? How do we do this? What are some tips? That's what we are going to see in today's session. We are going to introduce you, Elaine Stapnitsky from Salonga is going to actually take us through the first segment, which is uh, you know, give us an overview of what is community-led monitoring mail, different components of it. So she's going to talk about that. And then Diana Delgadero from uh, A Hunger Project Mexico is going to share with us one section of a tool that was collaboratively developed by uh, a research team from the movement. So the, the movement for community-led development had a collaborative research team comprising of 35 monitoring, evaluation, research, learning, and program specialists from 23 different organizations. That's our core team. In addition to that, we've had a lot of people from different organizations joining and working with us throughout the process. And both the tools that we will be sharing with you today were developed by this collaborative research team and are currently being used by many organizations in different parts of the world. So, but back to the structure. So, uh, no, can we go back, please? So the first segment of the session is really going to be what is community-led mail, and then Diana, like I said, is going to share with us a brief session, uh, a brief section of a tool that they developed, talking about how to do community-led uh, development. So, and then we'll have a fishbowl style discussion, which I will explain when we get there what it means. The second segment. Uh, Jennifer Simpson from PCI, a global communities partner, is going to share with us a tool that was again developed by the collaborative research team on specifically on CLD evaluation. So it's a 13 question tool, Excel based on doing CLD evaluations. We will again have a discussion around that and then we'll come back finally for key learnings and tips. So what is a fishbowl style discussion? A fishbowl style discussion is something is a style of discussion where we are all speaking with each other and learning from each other. So what is going to happen is that at some point in the conversation, everybody in the room is going to enter the panel. We won't all enter it at the same time because that's going to lead to chaos and uh, So we do want to kind of minimize noise and make sure it's productive time for everyone. So we are going to bring people in two at a time into the panel. And we will discuss the issues and whatever is being discussed. Uh, you know, whatever has been shared, we'll go over it, we'll go over your experiences, questions, reflections, concerns that you may have. And again, I'll explain more as we get to it. Next slide, please. Before I hand over to Elaine, I wanted to quickly share, you know, who are the, what is the team that has been doing this and what is the movement? So the movement for community-led development was launched on, in 2015 on the same day that the sustainable development goals were adopted by the UN General Assembly. It was a group of organizations who got together and said, well, if we really want to, you know, if we really want to attain the sustainable development goals, then we need to put communities front and center in development. And so, uh, 
Today, the movement comprises of over 1,500 local civil society organizations from all over the world and 72 INGOs, including I know some people are here, so Mercy Corps, World Vision, CARE, BRAC, Hunger Project, Save the Children, uh, all of them are part of the movement. Um, we operate national chapters and working groups, and then we have this collaborative research team, which I said, as I explained, is a global team spread across multiple time zones and countries where we work together in developing these tools and addressing some of our common concerns on community-led development and looking at its impact. So that's a very quick overview of the movement. And now I am going to hand it over to Elaine to tell us a little bit about what is community-led MEL and why is, does it matter? Great, thank you, Gintun. Um, so I am from Selanga and we are actively defining, um, working to define community-led monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. Uh, so we're, we're calling it COLMEL or COLMEL. Um, and we do this by uh, developing a capacity building frameworks for NGO staff to facilitate COLMEL through e-learning and virtual coaching components right now, especially due to COVID. We are also compiling a compendium of COMEL resources and a, and a COMEL toolkit for key stages of the process. And we're fostering learning around COMEL in various networks and communities of practice, which is uh, my interaction with the Movement for Community-Led Development. We're hoping to start a Canadian chapter focused on COMEL. And so as such, uh, Selenga is really trying to be a thought leader and innovative practitioner in this area. So what is it? Um, I do want to start off with a Mentimeter question. So if you're not familiar with Mentimeter, if you can open up another browser or you could use a smartphone or device, um, you can go to the website www.menti.com and uh, put in the code when you get there that's at the top of the screen um, and it should be able to lead you to this uh, question. And so you can submit as many words as you like, but what is one word that you would use to describe community-led uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning, um, either from your experience or if you are new to this concept, you know, what words come to mind uh, as, you, as you think about it? So I'll give this about a minute. And if anyone's having trouble, please just let me know. I do have the chat up. What is the so Menti number? Uh, the Menti four, code? Yep, it's at, it should be at the top here, 4296-8067. Four, okay, because we are only seeing your slide, we are not seeing the Menti <gasps> screen. Oh, that's helpful to know. Okay, let me reshare. I thought I shared my window, but I am sharing. Yeah, and I've put the uh, code in the chat box for anyone who needs it. Okay, are we seeing the Menti? No, oh, and I had the wrong code, sorry. Yes, now we can. Thank you. Great, necessary, challenging, good words. Any other thoughts? Yeah, definitely particip participatory. Yeah, and empowering, action-oriented. Nice. Yeah, definitely engaging. Great. I'm gonna close it off in about 10 seconds. It's appropriate, yes, appropriate to the context, inclusive, definitely. We're seeing participatory and empowering come to the fore here, definitely. Vision-based, contextual, yes. Great. So I feel people definitely have a good concept of, of the basis, horizontal, yes. Kind of linked to that concept of inclusive. Transparent, yes. In the interest of time, you can you can keep um, adding thoughts, and then we'll 
Um, maybe if we have time, I'll share this out again at the end or such. Um, but just to share a bit more about how we as the Selenga have been seeing um, community-led MEL, it's, we, we see it as a number of things and it can affect a number of things. And so it could be a framework. Um, let me get my pointer out here. It could be a framework as well as a process um, where, where we're enabling community members, including the vulnerable and marginalized, to lead the monitoring and evaluation of community projects, to draw lessons and learn from the information themselves. Um, and so we're not taking information away from them, but we're doing it with them. It could also be seen as an approach. So as we're coming in, it's kind of this broad concept of empowering community members to shift their roles from being just subjects of the data collection to becoming the drivers, analyzers, and users of the, of the monitoring and evaluation data and results. It can definitely be a system and needs to be integrated into systems so that um, it can complement formal meal systems uh, you know, most people will use a log frame basis or a results based management if you're Canadian based um, so that it doesn't function as a replacement for formal mail systems, but can definitely complement and work together so that you can have accountability both to the community as well as to donors and head offices. Um, it can also be a strategy um, to deepen community ownership and control over the projects as well as a tool or a toolbox of things to build capacity, as well as a step within the actual meal process. And so in, uh, in Selenga, we've kind of developed uh, a process to mobilize community members, especially the most mar marginalized to design implement um, so that they can see what's happening with their theory of change and share out those pieces. And so we've just outlined the steps that we are walking through with a different organization, different organizations of first budgeting and being ready um, and making sure it's suitable for their context, as well as then working with them to build the capacity of their staff who would then build capacity of community groups to run through all these processes. So again, um, we, we're a little short on time to walk through each of these, but each of these steps um, should be very familiar if you're a, a design monitoring and evaluation person. And so we build their capacity to do all these steps. And I had the pleasure of seeing that even, even though they may be literate or semi-literate, um, illiterate or semi-literate, they can also, if it's designed well, do the analysis by themselves. And then the interpretation and action comes automatic and you want them to be continuing to do this time and again. So I'll close with this. Um, these are just a few uh, quotes of what we want the community to be saying um, if you're doing community-led MEL. So we are in the community and we're taking a lead role in tracking results of our actions and drawing lessons and that they understand the barriers and are taking action. Um, and they are the collectors and analyzers and not just sub subjects. So I will pass back to Gunjan. Thank you so much, Elaine. And I know people may have questions. We are going to go through a lot of material very quickly. But remember, the fishbowl is a place for you to actually bring your questions, to bring your concerns. You can always put them in the chat box as well, but you will get time in the fishbowl for everybody to come in and talk about the questions that they have, as well as experiences and concerns. So with that, thank you, Elaine. I'm going to now ask Deanna to share with us. I know, Deanna, that uh, the tool that you were involved in developing kind of talks about CLD as a whole in the program lifecycle. But uh, what can it tell us about how does this tool look at community-led MEL? Uh, thank you, Gunjan. So yeah, now I want to introduce how we see and how we apply uh, community-led community MEL into based in, in a tool. So um, this is uh, the tool that I want to share is a self-assessment tool for CLD. And as Gunjian mentioned before, this is part of a collaborative uh, research that is happening inside the movement, uh, the movement for community-led development. And this is a global effort um, that um, that started, well, the, the movement started, was launched in, in 2015, as, as Gunjan, Gunjan mentioned, but this tool was launched recent, very recently in January 2021, and it was um, based on almost two-year experience of this collaborative global research, 
and it involved 35 people from, from 23 organizations. And this self-assessment tool is based in nine dimensions, which addresses the characteristics that we identify that CLD have. The, this tool is available in three languages and two formats, and we'll be sharing more about this uh, in the chat box. I can share the link and where you can download this tool um, for, for access and for knowing a little bit more about this tool. But uh, this tool is not necessarily for, uh, for decide if we're doing good or bad CLD. This is, uh, this is a tool for leveraging an inner, in, an inner process to see in which dimensions we could improve, whether we're from an organization, a funder, or maybe a community member. And this tool helps us to have evidence on the impacts of, sorry, on the impacts of, on CLD. And there are a lot of, uh, some more dimensions. So, but uh, what I want to share with you, and let me share my screen for going through um, through the, the the tool very very quickly, and I will share the the link in the chat. But this is a tool, so we have two formats. One of them is in uh, in an Excel sheet, and we have a mobile version of this, and uh, we have it in English, and French, and in Spanish. And now we're going to, to focus on this, uh, on the English version. Let me, of course, yeah. So, and we're going to focus just in the, the dimension of monitoring and evaluation practice for support CLD. Um, you can see uh, the, the nine dimensions over uh, in the list and some the dimensions are larger than others, but each of them has the same possible answers, which are gradual from, and it says from zero to four with zero it's no information, one is doesn't try, the two is tries, the three progressed and the four means succeed. And this is a really, really quick view of this tool, but for the purpose of this session and because we want to have time for the fishbowl, uh, we, uh, in this age dimension, uh, when we are focusing on participatory, sorry, monetary and evaluation practices for CLD. So in this section, we identify three dimensions that are relevant for really say that MEL is happening based on a CLD approach. Uh, first, on participatory monitoring and how it's carried out. So we have these four options. Uh, and as you can re read, it's incremental. In, it goes from no information or the information, it's not enough for a judgment, to the fourth, which is community participatory monitoring is central to the monitoring and evaluation approach of the program. The second question is um, about how participatory evaluation happens in the program. So in this case, what we want to see is that if it's possible to go through no communi community participatory evaluation, to have participatory process in some stages. It's like uh, maybe you, you, you have, a, you have a participatory planning in data collection, but, uh, but not in any other stage uh, of, the, of the evaluation. So you use a two or you, you give a two, you evaluate this, uh, this program with a two, or maybe they have three to four evaluation stages cover, then we, we could give, give a number three. But in the best, best case scenario, uh, community members are part of uh, and central of the evaluation, so we can have a four. And the third dimension, sorry, the third question, it's related to, uh, it's about m &E findings and if they are disaggregated based on different and relevant social differences and if this is, uh, and if the program acts upon, if they have, of the, or they take some, um, some measures about that. In an ideal scenario, we see that CLD mail happens when, based on our, in our tool, the, the CLD mail happens when community participatory monitoring is central, when community monitoring is facilitated by community members or structures and includes reporting back to people in a regular basis, like every six months. Six months. And also this happens when CLD, um, when community members are central in all of the evaluation stages from planning to the action plan. 
And also we see that uh, we have CLD uh, monetary, CLD mail when findings are disaggregated according to all the social differences that are relevant to the, to the intervention. And this is translated into, into actions in, in the actual program because we, we can improve that program. Um, so uh, more in a procedural matter, in every question, it's important to write down your your comments and your, your reflections about what you give this information because this can help you to, to use the tool uh, later on. But uh, this, is, this is something really valuable for you to identify how, you, I, uh, how, how do you uh, conceptualize the, uh, the male evaluation based on the CLD approach uh, with this tool. And this is uh, the thing that we wanted to share right now. Um, so I hope that uh, that gives you some elements on how we see the CLD. And right now um, we have, I think we have a poll. I, I will stop here. And I think uh, we have a poll, Sarah, if you can launch it. And of course, if you have any questions, we are going to use that for the, for the fishbowl process. Thank you, Diana. Um, so again, this was a very quick overview. We are actually the tool that looks very specifically at the different dimensions of you know, how to look at community-led MEL valuations is going to come in the second half. But this was more of an overview of what it would mean to weave this into the design process of the CLD program itself. If people can start filling out the poll, uh, you know, just based on what it is currently, do you or your organization include any of these aspects in the work that you do? Um, that would be wonderful. And again, this is just for us to begin to get a sense of what is happening, what needs to happen more, and what are some of the challenges that we are facing in different segments as we do this. And while people are putting in the responses, uh, I want to give a quick overview of how we're going to proceed in this fishbowl segment. So uh, I hope everyone knows the raise hand button. So if you go to... Uh, if you go to reactions on your screen, you will see a raise hand button. I would encourage you to use the raise hand button because in the fishbowl style discussion, we are going to invite people in pairs of twos to join the fishbowl and the conversation with us. You can, the idea behind the fishbowl is that we learn with each other and we learn from each other, even as we learn with the panelists. So there is a lot of horizontal discussion, brainstorming that goes on in that discussion. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, Anya. Uh, so just some of the things you can think, uh, do. You can actually ask any questions that you have of the two presenters uh, in the fishbowl. If you would like to ask questions of the presenters, I suggest you put your hand up first because in the fishbowl style discussion, people keep moving out. So your panelists are going to move out uh, in the after the first round of discussion and we'll have others coming in, carrying forward the conversation. Think about, have you done this? If you had to do, would you like to carry out community-led mail, right? Is it feasible? Is it necessary? If yes, what kind of enablers are there? What kind of barriers and challenges are we facing? Any concerns that you may have? And I see some people here who were at our morning training session. And I know there were some concerns raised about uh, the time requirements or the burden on the community. So any of those things can be brought into the fishbowl. Um, but before we go into the fishbowl, let's look at the results of the polling. Uh, can, uh, can we end the poll and look at the results, please? I know not everybody voted, but whatever we have. Okay, so based on whatever we've seen, it seems, and it's no surprise, that the area where communities are probably most involved are in the data collection aspects of MEL. And I am guessing I may be wrong, but this is probably because we often tend to involve enumerators from the community in data collection. So even within data collection, I would be curious in the fishbowl to see where community members are coming in my guess is it's probably happening in the collection of the data and not in the decision-making on what data is being collected, how. Uh, and then the least one seems to be, well, data analysis, 
uh, seems to be the least one. And there, there are two people, uh, at least two places where there is no community involvement. Okay, thank you very much. We are now going to move into the fish bowls. So uh, if you stop the screen share, thank you. So uh, can you please raise your hands if you would like to enter the fish bowl? If not, we will get two people randomly into the fish bowl. You will see yourselves in the spotlight. It's not necessary to speak if you're on the panel. It would be great if you speak, but it's not necessary for you to speak in the panel. But the idea is that let's see where we learn, what we learn and where the conversation takes us. So, and I see two people have come in already. Wonderful. Uh, so, Sarah, let's get the fishbowl started. And I am going to, while Sarah is doing that setup, I'm actually going to invite uh, Zenith. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Wonderful. Zenith, do you want to start, do you want to, whatever, your question, your reaction, uh, your experience, your concern, please feel free to say whatever you, you were wanting to say, and we'll get you into the spotlight soon. Okay. First of all, uh, I'm working with the community who were affected with a uh, uh, flood and cyclone for six and a half years. So I never seen that the community uh, led e uh, evolution. So this is uh, something that um, seems quite new to me and what I feel this is necessary for the community. But uh, there, in reality, I'm uh, a bit, uh, you know, confused and worried that is this actually possible for the community to let the evaluation for their actions? Because um, the community, the, what, what challenges I feel that the leadership from the community to make them, uh, uh, to have make them feel like this is their responsibility and take the uh, uh, leadership to uh, do the evaluation is a very big challenge because we are working with the community and make at, at first place make them understanding the thing is uh, uh, it took a lot of time so um, and them the, their mindset and they have the to they like for having their ownership for the evaluation and uh, carry the action uh, these are the barriers I think I if I have to implement I have to do that uh, in my with my communities and give them the evaluation uh, right to, to to evaluate their work. First, I need to change, make them to get that uh, leadership on themselves and change their mentality. I think. Perfect. Thank you so much, Zina. Those are uh, great points. And I wonder if Elaine or Diana, you want to respond to them, and then Asmita can also respond to this, or bring up another question. But anyone who wants to. Asmita, Elaine, Diana, anyone who wants to respond to Zenith's concern. I, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it is difficult and it definitely takes intentionality and it takes further planning. Um, a li little later on in the tips, I'll, I'll talk about what are kind of those enabling pieces, but you have definitely highlighted what some of those challenges are, is that, you know, there's, there's a, a number of sayings that I lean on. One is, um, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Um, and that's a, that's a common African proverb, but it means that if you go together, it does take more time. And if you are pressured in, especially emergency type situations, you know, the donors expecting certain deliverables within a certain time, it can be very challenging. And so in those cases, you may want to reduce scope and just focus on where are there elements that you can bring into the process and make it and just push it along the continuum of being more community owned? Um, or is there a particular part of the project that you can make participatory or more inclusive or give the community the power to make decisions um, on particular aspects of the project? Thank you, Elaine. Um, and I am going to come to Diana and Asmita and then Zenith back to you because in the panel, it's a back and forth. So it's not like you just say your piece and you are out. Uh, but before I get to that, I do have a request. So we are doing the fishbowl on Zoom for the first time. We've only done it in live sessions. 
And we've just discovered that for the panelists to be on the spotlight, they need to have your camera on. Now, I understand it's not possible for everyone to have their camera on, and it's okay. If that is a challenge, we will deal with it. But if you can, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Zenit and Asmita. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Zenit, Asmita, Diana, anyone wants to, Zenit, does that speak to your concerns? Is there anything else you want to say on that? Um. Uh, yes, like uh, what uh, Iana says, um, if it's not possible to make all the MNE system participatory, we can go for a certain uh, focused thing that we can make it participatory. Like I, um, the project I'm working is uh, in, we had just um, started working on a uh, community. I won't say like community-led uh, monitoring evaluation system, but uh, we are trying to be more uh, accountable to the community in our m &E system. Uh, so uh, what we are doing is like um, we are using uh, um, community self-assessment to realization for further action. It's like uh, we are um, the data we collected from the community, we're giving them back uh, the same data and we want them to analyze them or evaluate themselves on the basis of that. And uh, what we are doing further is like after that analysis, um, like evaluation, which uh, they do with uh, their collected data, they make their action plan. So um, it's a process. It's not a tool. Like it's a process uh, which uh, which we have named uh, as community self uh, self evaluation uh, to realization for further action. So it's kind of like um, we we thought that that were innovation to us but um, like uh, when uh, knowing from all of you uh, we have to do a lot on uh, community led uh, amenities so thank you so much for the learning too no oh, thank you asmata and i think one of the questions that does come up about community led mel and I, I know i heard this in the morning session i would be interested in seeing what others also feel as they come in is this constant thing of is it always possible or are there certain times and places where only certain things are possible and doable? And how does one decide that? And I know Gabriella, you also had a question and we'll bring that into and bring you into the fishbowl for that question. But for now, I want to go back to the current people in the fishbowl. Uh, Deanna? Yeah, I think that uh, if you think, if you see the, the CLD um, not as a process and not only, uh, it, not not only that happens just at some stage uh you can see that you you really need to 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 see the value on that i was thinking um on uh, on the experience on the hunger project on the cld the participatory mail uh, process and this is relevant for for people because even though they do have to develop some uh, some capacities for doing that because they need to be really aware of what of the relevance of the things that they are going to do because at, at, uh, it, it is true that it implies different activities more activities than they have to do it also gives them the strength to def to to uh, to make like a difference of their vision or their their work or the things that they are putting into some processes or some projects or some uh, actions that they have at the at the local level and based on that uh, on that community uh, that mail process participatory process they do have uh, information and they they are able to make decisions based on on that with their community authorities and that's that gives them the strength to to um, yeah to act differently it is also something that came into our attention that not every process can be that participative, participatory because of the uh, because of local views or local processes, inner ideas. Uh, for example, uh, based on women working with in in, in decision making spaces, and sometimes the local uh, knowledge or local traditions doesn't allow that to do that. But just putting the question in there, just starting a different process on how. Uh, people approaches to this uh, this idea so it's a process i want to just um uh, may, uh, like ask you all uh, one thing but do you really think that um, the uh, 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 locally led monitoring the donor will be agreed with this they will because that monitoring that is start with the very first 
like the planning planning of the uh, of the community and what are the they designing their own action and plan so that needs to sustain and without uh, local resource mobilization doesn't like not uh, goes appropriately all the time so we they need additional support and i don't know how uh, the donors will agree with this this is like i don't see any door for this i'm, I'm just not being negative but i'm here to like i hope there is uh, there is always a re, uh, option maybe some, you can ask no, and Zina, that's that's actually it's not about being negative at all. I think this whole conversation is about you know kind of looking at some of the practical challenges and what is needed. Uh, I, I I think the only thing I will say to that is that you know. Uh, it's not easy. And you're right that, you know, one of the things about community-led monitoring is that it does require more resources or more resources yeah. at a certain stage in the process, yes. right? Yes. So it's all at what stage do you need to invest more? Uh, what stage more intensity? You know, is the community with I'm working with, they plan their own design of action. Like they need to raise their planes because flood is there every time, every year. They need, need a sanitation support. They need table because women didn't eat for days because they don't have toilet to go during flood. So the monitoring and evaluation that they do, but they need support. Local resource mobilization never will like fulfill the need. So, um, and this, uh, yeah, maybe in uh, in it will come with the with time and more effort and more uh, like uh, we need to generate more evidence. I think so. And yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the donors are beginning to at least talk about community-led yeah. monitoring and evaluation now. What this? When will this talk translate into actual funding being made available for this? Is is of course a question that you know that we don't know answer to. But the interesting thing for me has been that in the last few months, at least, I've heard increasingly donors begin to speak about the need for this. Uh, and, and so now we need to see if people will put their, you know, if they're going to actually yeah. want to talk. Yeah. I think this one should be one of the principle of locally led adaptation. You know, they, one of the principle, like they have the flexibility and predictable funding. I think that this should be goes there because they're then more like focus will be upon this title. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And I am going to, uh, we, I know it's time to swap fishbowl because we also have, so what's going to happen is we're going to be able to take two more people into this fishbowl. Diana and Elena are going to step out and we're going to have two more people join Asmita and Zina to carry this conversation forward. After which we will go into the next presentation on this actual evaluation tool. And we will come back to the questions and see is that, has that brought in more clarity or more confusion? And then we will have Elaine, Deanna, and Jen, who is going to be our third panelist, come back in the end with tips and to answer questions. So, so it's going to be a, a different structure, but the conversation will carry on throughout these 75 minutes. But uh, Sarah, if you can bring in, I don't know if anybody has hands up who would prefer to come in in this round. If not, I see uh, two people. I see Gabriella had a question. Uh, or a comment, so maybe uh, we can bring Gabriella in and uh, one more person if they want to come in. I know Edel said that Edel um, is on public transport, so can't speak. But Oh, can you? Perfect, Edel, if you can, oh, you can't speak? Okay, Thanks. we can see you and I will be your voice while you are there. So, so thank you. Gabriella, is there anything okay. that- Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I came in a little bit late, sorry, apologies for that. And I need to go early as well, sorry. But my question is, um, well, at Go, I work for Go, and and this is a um, this is our aim to 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 promote and to um, being uh, may making this monitoring evaluation led by communities. Uh, however, as we are in that process. My question is, which are the main barriers that you have encountered uh, when starting implementing this in, in your organizations? Um, I have few, but I would like to know what are like the key actions you have undertaken to address those barriers from top to down? Because I, I know that, for example, meal teams are aware of the necessity of communities leading monitoring and evaluation, 
they are this external party that can better say we are say, we are doing what what is expected to be done, right? Um, it's like the external evaluators, but you know the, the most important ones because they are the ones for which we are trying to build well-being and so on. So, um, which are the main barriers encountered when trying to promote this within meal teams, right, or at management levels and what are the main actions to overcome or to address these? Yes, uh, so uh, those are excellent questions. And I think that's again going to about how do, we, how do we actually put this into practice, right? And how do we put into practice comes at various levels. So there are the donor level challenges that we talked about. And then now there are, the, there are challenges not just at the donor level, there are challenges also at the operational level within teams, right? Uh, because a lot of it comes down to this question of power dynamics, right? Uh, because even within between us and the communities, whether we like it or not, there does exist a power dynamic. And be, to be able to see that control, right? And to say that we are going to actually listen and have the community define instead of us defining what is important in this project and work through the indicators with them so that we have really very little control then over the results that are coming up, right? Or what we want to put out. And that, that does require uh, a lot of, I think, conversation. But I think it's also somewhere around this whole question of how do we begin to look at CLD as a process overall, right? But uh, I know Adele, you can't speak. Uh, I have your question I will, and I will say that and I'll bring it in for you. But Asmata and Zinat, if any of you wanted to come in on what Gabriella said, uh, or asked. And again, Gabriella, we'll have the panelists respond to it later on when they come back into the fishbowl. But for now, if Zinat and Asmata, if you want to add to the conversation while I pull up Adele's comment. Um, I think uh, uh, what we need to uh, make this in process that good intention of the implementer, like us, we are uh, civil society because the what the result will come from the evolution. Uh, maybe we are not expecting that from the community. We are planning something else in our mind. So the intention of accept, uh, accepting those, uh, what community is saying and community needs is need, should be there. And the community uh, uh, to raise their, uh, uh, to do the uh, evaluation uh, properly or structure where they need some knowledge and guideline. I, I also think that to uh, like get, make them the evaluation what they need and they uh, will be needing in future. They need to be trained on that. They need to be that those doors should be open for them to understand. So I don't know, I couldn't think more about this. Maybe Asmita can uh, uh, add. Um, uh, nothing on Gabriela's um, question. Like I do have a concern, uh, like, um, most of the people in our communities are not well educated uh, to know about all this process. And uh, just uh, when we go with them to uh, collect some data for the assessment, they don't have enough time. Like they can't give us a uh, half an hour or 15 minutes to. Uh, so um, in that point, like how can we engage? What are the things that we need to consider to make them involved in the process of our MEL? So uh, I just wanted to know about uh, all these things. I I I'm they, so they curious to know hope. about all these things. <laughs> I think they lost the hope that something can happen. Right. No, and these are all very valid concerns. So I, I, I think, you know, Aspita and Zinat and uh, Gabriella, to your questions, like I said, we will come back to all of them. But right now, all I wanted to flag are a couple of things. Uh, and then I want to read Adele's point and, and welcome Jen into the panel. But uh, to your questions, you know, so, so the whole thing about organization ceding control and to kind of, you know, ex being accepting of that, that requires a shift in mindsets not just, so when we talk of mindset transformation and community-led development, we always talk about external mindset transformation, right? We talk about going to communities and transforming their mindsets so that they believe in their agency and voice. We forget that there is also a lot of inter, you know, internal mindset transformation that needs to happen within our teams and within us and as organizations to be able to do this, right? Because till that happens, we may say we will do CLD because that kind of localization seems to be the topic of the day, but it's not going to happen, 
So it's it's not easy. And 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 Smita, about I think you raised two very important questions, right? I think the time question is something that keeps coming up again and again, not just about community-led Mel, I would say. It's a general question when it comes to community-led development work. We just conducted a study of about 100, 173 programs across 65 countries that were self-declared as CLD programs, right? And all of them depend heavily on community groups and the work of community members. Yet this is all, un and a lot of them are women, right? If these are the most marginalized and the most excluded people in the community, then they're also the people who have the re time resource on their hands. And yet we are adding to that. So how do we manage that? I think remains one of the fundamental challenges of CLD and something that we are trying to, you know, I don't think we have answers yet, but I think we are looking for these answers in conversations like these and with donors and others to say that fundamentally the way we fund things and do things has to change because there are these concerns. About the knowledge part, and I'm sure that, you know, about the ability to do this, right? Like, do they know this or not? There's something that I'm actually going to have Elaine come back when she comes back, come and address, because I know this is something that she has spoken to. I've heard her speak to this. Uh, so I'm actually going to let her address that part of it. But I think we need to think about what we regard as knowledge and skills. We are used to a certain language of monitoring and evaluation. And and certain methods and methodologies. And it's true that the communities will not know that. But communities do know that if they are creating a program, what do they need to know for that program to work well or not? So it's, it's essentially that bridge. Our role perhaps is that role of that bridge that when they identify what they need and how they want to do it, we kind of translate that into the language that funders and donors and us understand. So maybe our job is that translation. So Adele has had the point about knowledge and M&E is political and engaged in power dimensions. Knowledge is the origin of consensus and community are diverse. How do we ensure that community-led M&E processes are inclusive and that the most marginalized needs come to the front in the M&E process? Again, excellent question. I think some of that was what I was trying to say. Uh, when I was also referring to the hierarchies and, and the inclusiveness. But uh, hopefully, Adele, you will soon be at the point where you are able to speak and come into the conversation. For now, I am going to move to Jen, uh, Jennifer Simpson from PCI, who is going to share with us a tool which so far we were talking about in general uh, and you know some of the challenges. Now what we're going to look at is that there is a tool that we can at least begin to ensure that our evaluation reports are much more congruent with the principles of CLD, even if you're not able to do all of CLD. So Jen, over to you. Hi, everyone. And I really appreciated the discussion in the fishbowl. I just wanted to add, you know, as we're thinking about how we do community-led Mel and thinking about, it's not just about you know, the communities and stakeholders being trained and engaging them, but also this mindset for our own program and our own staff who need to be able to do it well uh, and efficiently. Um, and that these kinds of engagements also include, you know, a lot of trust building. And so I think there are some, you know, internal program, you know, for our own staff capacity building um, in, that, in that light. So I'm gonna walk you all through a quality evaluation quality appraisal tool. Um, I put a link in the chat. It is accessible online. Um, and as I pull up the tool, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this tool was commissioned um, to support the assessment of studies and evaluations. It was designed to appraise the strengths and weaknesses of evaluation reports in terms of their methodological rigor and community-led development principles. And so as such, it includes all the phases of a program evaluation based on its corresponding report. And it also includes elements of community-led monitoring and evaluation. So I'll point those out as we go through this tool. It was developed through participatory two-phase and a piloting process with a number of m and and technical experts from multiple organizations so this tool was developed as part of the uh, movement's collaborative research team that Gudjan mentioned at the beginning of the session. 
So this tool is really meant for users to include m and &E staff, but also other program staff. Um, these are individuals who may be commissioners of and or those who conduct the evaluations themselves. And similar to the CLZ tool that we got a little glimpse of, um, it's not- sorry, Jen, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, if you're trying to screen share, then we can't see your screen. Sorry about that, um, it's coming. So, sorry. Thank uh, you. <laughs> All right, hopefully you can see uh, a picture yeah. of the tool now. Okay, now we great. can, thank you. Thank you, all right. So it's intended not just to educate good versus bad evaluation. So it's not just about grading an evaluation and this is a bad or a good evaluation, but really I hope it serves as a learning tool about how we can improve our evaluation process through using the tool to assess our report. Um, there are other tools out there uh, that evaluate uh, evaluations or assess evaluations, um, but this tool is different um, from others in that while the foundational understanding of a robust evaluation approach is helpful, this tool is meant to be simple enough for really any of your staff to apply. And the second, the tool supports the standardization of best practices in particular for community-led development. So uh, as you can see, this tool is built in Excel and you will see that uh, there are two tabs. There is a guide tab and then the tool itself tab. So first I'll just kind of give you um, some quick information through the guide um, because uh, it goes through the scope and purpose of this toolkit, which I gave you a bit of an overview already and how to use the tool itself. Um, You'll also see that the tool ends up providing a score or a rating. Uh, and there is an overall evaluation report score, but we also provide a CLD specific score. Um, these scores are embedded into the available answer choices within the tool. So whether you answer a particular question in the tool as a yes, a no, or a partial, there's a grade that's given to each question on the tool and the scores are summed and reported in the tool tab. So we'll go through that. So we also noted that some of the questions are weighted. Um, and though all the questions in this tool are important, there are 13 questions. Um, during the development of the tool, some questions were determined to be extra critical and therefore they are weighted a little bit more heavily. So this is really what's in the guide. To, to help remind users of the scoring and the weighting process. So let's look at the tool itself. Uh, on the second tab, you can put your evaluation title at the top, who's actually doing the assessment and when. And then you'll see at the top, uh, there is the actual score. So uh, you can go back to the guide to reference you know, where you fall in the score. Um, but really, again, this is about uh, a guide of about how you're doing. Um, then we have the 13 questions, um, which are also noted as indicators in true ME form um, on this tool. Um, and you'll note that some of the questions are um, have a little bracket with a CLD beside them. So that way the users actually know in the tool which of questions have the community-led development relate, you know, are the community-led development related questions. So the first one, I, you know, there are 13 questions, but I kind of want to highlight the CLD questions for you. So the first one has to do with how the report provides information to understand the local context in which the intervention was implemented. And so what this question is getting at is really um, how well the evaluation team sought to understand the local context um, as they relate to the program and activities and the evaluation activities pertaining to that program. The second one is around does the, sorry, are the data collection tools piloted? Oh, sorry, I missed one. Um, does the report discuss involvement of relevant stakeholders? during the evaluation design, in particular, the community stakeholders. 
So this is looking at during the design stage of the evaluation itself, not necessarily the design stage of the whole program, but at the design stage of evaluation where the evaluation questions are being determined and refined, uh, were local relevant stakeholders engaged in that process? The second, another question is, are data collection tools piloted and adapted through a test phase with relevant community members? So this is going on to more around the actual data collection tools and the piloting and adapting. So a lot of times we could be developing brand new tools. Sometimes they're standardized tools. But are we looking at our tools uh, with the lens of our communities in which we will be applying these tools to be culturally and contextually relevant? Another CLD specific question is around whether the report discusses the involvement of relevant stakeholders during the preparation and implementation of data collection. So this is getting at the contribution of local knowledge to effectively adapt our tools and this also includes trainings for enumerators. So those who are going out to actually collect the data, how they're asking the questions and in what context they're asking the questions, and also quality control processes, such as back translations uh, for, for accurate translation. And finally, does the report discuss involvement of stakeholders during the evaluation analysis and review of findings? So this particular question is really trying to get at whether the local communities and leadership have an opportunity to review the findings and contribute to the interpretation of results. So this is really trying to assess, are we not just take collecting the data, writing up our evaluation reports and moving on, <laughs> um, or are we going back to the communities in which we were working and actually sharing back and actually asking for their contributions into what the results mean and would mean for them. So these are a few of the CLD specific questions in the tool. Um, the other tools are getting more at uh, basic rigor. So there are questions around, um, you know, whether their report is, you know, clearly defining the evaluation questions, uh, whether the analysis was done correctly, um, does the uh, report bring up uh, issues such as potential biases um, in the analysis? Um, but basically, you would go to use this report, you simply would go through question by question. You would read the indicator, decide based on your definition, uh, a yes, a no, or a partial score. And the tool will automatically calculate your running total as you go through. And so what you'll see as you answer all of the questions, that ultimately you'll get a final score and a final CLD specific score. And so this is the overview of the tool and how it works and the kinds of content that it takes. Um, so I think you know, it would be really great if you're able to go through, download the tool, get a sense. And I'm hoping that we can move into the discussion to think about, uh, you know, yes, this is a tool and Ashmita had a comment in the previous fishbowl about, you know, community led monitoring is less of a tool, it's more of a process. So how does this tool, how could it be used or useful to explore how the process exists, for example? So I'm really interested in to hear what you all have to say about the tool. So I will pass it back over to Gunjan for the fishbowl. Thank you so much, Anne. And, uh, and, you know, I know Gabriella and a couple of people had to leave, but I was going to say to her that this was one of the things, you know, in almost an answer to her question about how do we begin to do it within organizations, and maybe we can start, you know, small. Uh, Jen, if you stop sharing your screen, we can still see your screen. Uh, uh, but maybe the answer is to start small and to start with a tool like this to begin if seeing how do we gradually build up, right? It's 13 questions. We wanted to keep it simple so that everybody could use it irrespective of the size of the organization. You know, uh, you are able to do it. It's not extremely complicated, uh, but still you start with the basics and it tells you how communities can begin to be involved. We will not have time for a fishbowl, but I do want to give people the chance to ask any specific questions they have around the tool.
to Jennifer, as well as to kind of any concerns, comments that they have, or if there has been a very rich discussion in chat, I know, uh, if, you know, listening to this or looking at the tool, some of your previous concerns are getting addressed, are they getting actually even more intensified? So we'll have about, a, you know, five minutes or so, if people can raise their hands, if anyone has any questions, reactions, comments. Uh, I see Gloria. Yes, please, Gloria. Hi, thank you for the, for the time. I, I had a question and it's kind of uh, related to what was said about thinking of this um, as a process. So I wanted to ask uh, to, the, to the panelists um, if they think the tool or some of the indicators included in the tool could, use, could be used as a progress report. So uh, when, when um, evaluating policy or programs and especially social, social programs, we, we usually do like a mid review. You know, when, when the project's half done or when you've spent the most of the money, um, you want to see how you're going, how you're doing. But uh, from, a, from an institutional point of view, uh, this evaluation tends to be on the indicators that you proposed from the start, on the number of people that you've attended, on the number of people who participated, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thinking about the, this tool, do you think it could be used? It could be, a, a, is it appropriate to use like midway or at different points of one investment or one project? And thank you for that. Jen? Um, oh, go ahead, Gendron, if you want to go. No, 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 I was gonna ask you if you want to answer that. <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, the short answer is yes. I think there's ways to use these tools for that kind of purpose. I as I've been getting to know and use these tools, um, I kind of find, found a lot of different areas where they can be either applied as they are or elements of them could be adapted for certain purposes. Um, so for example, um, on this evaluation quality appraisal tool, um, you know, it can be used to assess uh, your, how you did on a particular evaluation based on this report. But also before we even get to the evaluation, we're looking at these indicators and seeing, okay, as we're designing our evaluation and creating guidance around, you know, an evaluation scope of work or TOR, you know, these elements are going to be included in that evaluation plan from the beginning. And that kind of helps ensure, or we hope it'll help ensure that down the road, once we do the evaluation, um, we would actually then see that reflected in the reports a little better as well as updating like our evaluation writing guidance, for example. Um, so those are some of like the ways that we're like applying this tool in not just the tool itself as it stands, but also like taking from it and, and trying to apply it in other ways. I do think that when we're talking about participatory m um, and community-led m and um, you know, building that and incorporating it within your m and &E plans and not like an addendum to the plan, but actually having it sort of embedded foundationally within your m and &E plan is going to be really important. Um, and we've had some lessons learned within our own organization around how we can do that more effectively um, so that when we're reporting on indicators, our IPPP is not just donor indicators or custom indicators. We also have um, these other types of indicators like participatory monitoring indicators, sustainability readiness indicators, um, but they're all part and parcel of our m and &E plan. So I don't know, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Thank you, Jen. Okay, we are going to be, we're running behind time. And uh, so I want to make sure that, and I know people, we did the promise tips on how to do this. So I want to bring back Elaine to kind of quickly give us some tips on, on, you know, from actual experience of doing this, how do we overcome or address at least some of the barriers that people talked about. And then after Elaine, we will have uh, a minute each for both of the presenters, panelists for any last words that they have. Uh, and then we'll come back to the audience. But Elaine, over to you. Great, so I hope I'm sharing my screen to let me know if you're not seeing the prerequisite conditions. 
uh, some of these are, it's basically consolidating some of the discussion we had already. So having a commitment from the donor, and if not the donor, then the implementing organization or the partners to make um, community-led MEL work is very important. Um, if, if you're pushing against that, it can be very difficult. And so it does take time. It does lean on your relationships with people and with the donors um, as to their openness and to build in the time for it. Community commitment was raised during these uh, discussions is that maybe they're too busy. And so if they're, it needs, the concept needs to be introduced to community leaders and the community people who may be involved because they would need to set aside time. You wanna be building into the systems and structures um, you know, and considering what sort of compensation um, the community values it at and what they can build as resources or what may need to be complemented by organization and external funding to at least set up the initial system. Um, and then the willingness, as people were saying, to give voice to the vulnerable and marginalized, some of whom are often women um, or those with disabilities or um, other vulnerabilities. And then having a strong feedback mechanism. So this speaks to a number of organizational enablers, whether within your organization, there is already transparency being fostered, whether they want to be hearing from, from different um, stakeholders, especially those who are being affected by the programming that they have. Uh, this, is, this is a handout that we're developing that will be available on our website um, soon, within the next few months. Um, month or so I should say, but what are some of the key considerations? So I'm not gonna go with it in detail, um, but as you see, there's a lot around flexibility, whether it's around designing the tools or the flexibility in the funding or the time, uh, that in-depth initial assessment that the um, MCLD has developed, um, trying to get a full understanding with the community of um, one on the one side, the organizational readiness, um, but then also what's happening in the community. Um, we do want to make sure we're not leaving people behind. Um, there, are issue, there are questions or concerns around quality of data, uh, but we, this is really building from a utilization focused evaluation. And so meaning that the more people use the information, the more improved the quality will be, um, as opposed to kind of our typical M&E, which is usually research based. How do we get those? Um, you know, control groups in place and trying to get to the nth degree of accuracy um, th that we can spend a lot of resources on. Um, the focus is more on use. And then um, again, some pieces around resources at the beginning of the project period, whether it's staff time or funding um, or time itself to make sure that you've set it up well. Um, but as we said, it may not be right for all the context. So just to highlight some of the learnings that we have around what we what are benefits of this is um, it provides evidence at all levels, predominantly for those who the, the programs are effective, affecting predominantly, supports good governance, fosters partnership, definitely strengthens their community capacity, which leads to sustainability, uh, catalyzes development. I have, I have seen and trialed that um, and I'm convinced um, and it can be less expensive if designed well, but as mentioned, it, you know, it may be more qualitative than quantitative data. Um, there can be limitations due to literacy and numeracy of the community, but I have, again, you can design these processes in participatory ways using um, figures um, and simple uh, metrics and rubrics so that um, you can get around that. And so I, we do have a number of examples of that as well that I don't have time to share. Um, it may not necessarily replace your formal MEL system for your project or for the donor. Um, and if it's not done well, well, it can reinforce existing power dynamics of which we've discussed extensively. But thanks for that time. I'll pass back to Gunjin. Thanks so much. So Deanna, I'm going to come to you and Jennifer now after Deanna for your one quick takeaway, reflection, answer, response, anything to the session. Yeah, Deanna. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gunjan. I think that uh, what, it's think, what I'm thinking right now is that this session, it's intended to have this, this, uh, this moment for, um, for what is community led. And what I think it's very uh, pretty clear for me now is that we we do have experiences on community led based on the on the experience of one organization in this case PHP for example but 
this is something useful on how do we need to build on the community, on capacity community, com in capacities in communities for addressing this. And also something that I, I was thinking it's, this needs to be relevant for communities, not only for funders or whatever. And this is also a, ch a mindset shift for everyone who's involved in, in in male, uh, in, in male systems, in male, developing male systems. We need to, to think differently on why we need these male, not only for, uh, for, uh, um, for accountability for, to a funder, but also towards the community and also to, to understand different times in, inside the communities. So it's a new way to understand monitoring and evaluation. It's not only a different way to do it, but also a different uh, uh, it has a different purpose. So uh, I think that's kind of my key takeaway for this, uh, because it is a process, but it, it's not only, I mean, it, it's, it's because it's changing constantly and we need to adapt into that, always based on human dignity and on, on communities in the center. Thank you, Diana. Jen? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, for me, I think uh, one of the key takeaways is that, you know, Comel may be a somewhat aspirational right now, but there are steps that we can take to concretely move ourselves into that direction to get there. Um, we'll need to consider how we effectively and efficiently incorporate these principles of community-led development and community-led MEL into our existing MEL plans. So we're going to need to talk with and convince our donors, but we're also going to be need to become listeners uh, with the communities in which we're working um, so that we're not the ones saying, well, we know what it needs to look like, but actually to become, you know, more of the listeners and, and, and really work with our, our participants. Um, so I would say to focus on the process and, and what we can do um, in the interim and step-by-step step move our, ourselves in that direction. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I, we, we wanted to keep a couple of minutes and we literally have like one minute left though, but if anybody in the participants and people in the room, if they have anything that they want to share in terms of any key takeaway, something that clicked or learning from the session, then that would be wonderful. You can put it on chat. You can just unmute yourselves and speak. And in the meantime, my colleague Anya is going to put into the chat box uh, email IDs for all the panelists and for me. So if anybody wants to get in touch to kind of, you know, discuss more about community-led mail, to share the resources, to learn more about the resources. Salanga has a bunch of resources. The movement is having very active conversations around this. We have a group that is going to be looking more and more into this. Uh, you're very welcome to engage uh, with all of us. So we will be sharing the email IDs. But does anyone want to share anything? Was there anything that was new? Was there anything that you learned? Any key takeaway? Anything? Just unmute and speak. Don't even wait for me to call on you. I, I can maybe quickly. Yes say a small comments because we are, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer and we're working a lot on governance and trying to help small scale fisheries community to uh, set up co-management uh, systems and frameworks. And uh, we have been starting to think about a project to, uh, to actually being able to be able to give that time that communities needs to set up and create their own uh, co-management systems. And, um, I think some, like we're trying to look at blended finance schemes to see if we could find a way to convince investors to really invest in the long term. And I think if I, just looking at your, uh, your tool makes me think that it could be something pretty useful to try to convince investors. So, so saying, okay, look, look at this, this, uh, this tool, we're gonna be following up, the, the community is gonna be following up the, the evolution of their own uh, evaluation monitoring systems so that they can be independent and they can continue to to uh, yeah to to have their project running just by themselves so thank you i think it was really really useful wonderful thank you so much Josephine. anyone else 
Otherwise, I know we are at time. Actually, we are one minute over. So, uh, and we know it's been a long day, but thank you everyone. Thank you for bringing in all your insights to all the people who entered the fishbowl. It was an experiment. It wasn't as smooth as we expected it to be, but hopefully it will be better next time. But thank you so much for learning with us, for asking very interesting and difficult questions and for everything that you have shared, uh, you know, in the, yeah, in both in the comments, in the chat box, as, uh, as well as in the discussion section. So if we can just put up the last slide, Anya, and we will let everyone uh, carry on with their day. But thank you so much. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we will be in touch if you would like us to be, and we look forward to working with you more on these issues.